definitely a source of inspiration for us here and pioneered many of these techniques that we'll talk about. Um, here we can see in the simulation just how precise and deep into the brain one can theoretically penetrate uh, with a focused transducer. And here uh, the paper deals with targeting the thalamus. Finally, it does seem to work. So the in vitro uh, small and large animal studies and now human studies are reproducing and expanding on each other's work and showing some uh, promising excitatory and inhibitory paradigms. So that's, uh, that's great. And uh, we can all help to push the field along. I do want to mention some disadvantages of, uh, of TUS for neuromodulation. Um, first of all, intervening tissues. So unlike magnetic fields and electric fields, which can pass through the skull fairly freely without any problem whatsoever, uh, acoustic waves do undergo absorption, reflection, and scattering as they pass through the complex anatomy of the skull that we'll see later. And uh, there are some confounders. Um, stimulation of the peripheral nervous system is almost unavoidable with TUS, uh, since many of the transducers vibrate or tingle or make a sound when they're powered on. And this can be mitigated to some degree, and we can, we'll talk about that in a later slide. Uh, but this does make blinding difficult to accomplish, uh, much in the case of uh, TMS as well. So finally, that's a uh, little picture there lost in translation. There is a language barrier here. So our central nervous system evolved as an electrical network. Um, that's why the injection of electrical current with DBS, uh, or when you apply electrical voltage, can easily excite the nervous tissue. And so the neurons and the ion channels don't really natively speak the language of ultrasound and potentially might help explain why some of the effects we're seeing in humans are relatively modest. So quick historical context, because I, I find these very fascinating, these hand-drawn uh, manuscripts uh, about 60 years ago now. Uh, this is one of the seminal papers. Uh, about 60 years ago, the Fry brothers were able to uh, reduce the size of these visual evoked potentials in cats by applying sonication to the lateral geniculate nucleus, one of the, the visual pathway circuits. And uh, you can see here on the left is uh, before sonication, they called it irradiation in the paper. That's the visual evoked potential uh, amplitudes. Right after sonication, you see that they're markedly reduced. And 30 minutes afterwards, they're back to baseline. Uh, now, back then, one of the basically one of the fundamental limitations of pus was that uh, you can get through the skull without damaging and frying the tissue along the way. So in this experiment, they did remove the skull of the unfortunate cat. Uh, but this uh, paved the way for showing that reversible changes could be induced with, with this technique and this modality, rather than just with electricity as has been used much earlier. Now, we've come a very long way since then. And when I started my PhD about four years ago, there was probably only 13, 13 14 papers published on uh, human applications of TUS for neuromodulation. But uh, now, as you can see here, there's probably that many papers published per year and uh, in many, many different targets. When I was reading these studies, though, I noticed something I'll call the, the Fermat problem. And uh, Pierre de Fermat was a mathematician about 400 years ago. And uh, he wrote about one of his theorems. I've discovered a truly remarkable proof, but this margin is too small to contain it. I can't find the space. So because of this, mathematicians were searching for about 350 years before they finally solved, uh, solved the proof. And to some degree, while we can get papers fairly easily nowadays, the problem still exists. Journals just don't give us the word count we want. And uh, we're so excited by our uh, findings and talking about our results that the details often get missed. So we've all seen this in the uh, neuromodulation papers, custom transducers, custom scripts, gel, collimator. That's great, but it, it leaves a lot of unanswered questions, especially for those of us who want to set up a neuromodulation lab or those graduate students new to the field like I was. So I'd like to spend a, a few slides tackling these issues one by one. This was me four years ago asking questions. What kind of gel, what kind of transducer? Do they make a sound? What about the hair? Um, so we'll talk about that. First of all, 
how do you select your transducer? So some considerations to keep in mind. You should already have a research question, brain target, and outcome measure in mind before making the purchase or before even talking to the uh, manufacturer. And the reason is most transducers operate within a, a narrow band of frequency, and they do have limitations on how much power they can put out or their focal depth. And uh, so we'll talk about that. Your, uh, your uh, outcome measure will also influence the type of transducer you want. So for example, if you want to study online effects with TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, you should probably look for something uh, very slim and something non-ferromagnetic, um, so no steel in the transducer. As well, if you're looking at fMRI studies using the transducer in the, uh, in the MRI, or, or in the room, you should also keep in mind uh, ferromagnetism. Uh, neuronavigation is also a consideration. So if you want to couple some sort of device to track your transducer, the shape of the transducer matters. And similarly, for EEG studies, uh, something a transducer that could fit between the electrodes or under an EEG cap is, is something to consider. And also the coupling medium, because uh, we all know that air is the enemy of ultrasound. And so uh, some transducers do come with a built-in coupling medium. Others, you will have to either make your own gel uh, or use a, a collimator or something like that. So that's also important to think about. Uh, the fundamental frequency is, is what I'll start off with here. When we look at all these uh, human studies published to date, and their choice of transducer frequency, we see that most of them cluster um, between you know, zero and one megahertz or 1000 kilohertz. There is a bit of a trimodal peak there with 500 kilohertz, very, very popular. Uh, 250 is a close follow up, and just below 700 is, is a third place. And there's, of course, some outliers on the right there beyond the megahertz range. And these are typically unfocused diagnostic transducers. But by and large, most labs have stayed within this narrow frequency uh, domain. And there's a good reason for that. So mostly this has to do with the optimal frequencies that minimize uh, ultrasonic losses through the skull bone. The anatomy of the skull and cross section is what you're seeing on the slide. It's uh, basically a sandwich of, of three layers. And I think it's good to appreciate the the anatomy of something so simple looking, uh, macroscopic, uh, macroscopically as a skull. Um, but really, it, it's quite complex. So you have a sandwich of, uh, first of all, your cortical dense compact bone at just below the scalp. Then you have your um, cancellous bone or spongy bone or diploe. There's several names for it. That's where most of the blood vessels course within. And uh, then finally, just before the dura and the brain, you have the, another layer of cortical bone. So it's, uh, it's not a homogenous uh, bone. There's, there's lots going on there. And um, uh, when you look at the frequency versus attenuation studies, and this has been simulated numerically and also experimentally verified, as far back as the 70s, we see that there's a clear linear relationship between increasing fundamental frequency and how much attenuation or how much acoustic losses you're going to get from your transducer, sorry, from the skull. And, and this is exactly the reason why most uh, fundamental frequencies have stayed in this range here to minimize the attenuation coefficient and minimize the, the amount of, uh, of losses you have. And this leads to a lower power output being required from your transducer. Uh, so dampening effects, effects of the skull are, are, as I said, extremely non-trivial. There are individual differences and a lot of frequency dependence as well. But uh, if you want a rough number to go by um, around that 500 kilohertz window that is very popular in, in many studies, the evidence tells us that the human skull will absorb about 75% of the en energy or the intensity delivered on it, which is a useful number to know if you want to derate your hydrophone pressure measurements to estimate some sort of uh, uh, initial intracranial intensity. Uh, there's great tool toolboxes out there like uh, the K-Wave developed by Bradley, Treby and colleagues that will allow for subject specific values to be estimated. 
and many labs are going, including our own, are going to uh, towards CT measurements. So scanning the subject or the patient with a CT, and that way you get a good idea of the skull morphology, and then you can calculate individualized treatments or individualized experiments to the subject. And so I think I already mentioned, but it's approximately 75% on average at the 500 kilohertz frequency. And there's a few citations and fantastic papers that, that deal with uh, quantifying and uh, calculating these numbers. So although most focus transducers have a single recommended central frequency, like 500 kilohertz, like in this example from one of our devices, um, it's valuable to look at the test report the company provides because often you'll get a few bonus freebies or bonus frequencies to work with as well as the, uh, the, the central frequency. So in this case, we have um, the harmonics at uh, just under 400 and uh, just over 600 kilohertz that can also be used with this exact same device. The caveat here is from the test report, you can see on the y-axis that there will be uh, a decibel loss and so your, um, your amount of energy that you're going to have to put out. So for example, if your amplifier is delivering watts, you're going to have to put out a greater amount of watts to achieve the same intracranial intensity, all other things being equal compared to your fundamental frequency. But uh, in this case, it's, it's about a quarter of a negative decibel less, or rather more power that you'll have to put in. Um, to, to use these frequencies, um, you might need to purchase or, or make your own impedance matching box uh, that will allow for this to, to, to be delivered. But often that's much less expensive than purchasing, you know, a dedicated transducer just for another frequency you want to try. Uh, and as I'll talk about later, very important, you have to re-quantify your transducer at each of these frequencies um, just to make sure that your, your power measurements are, in fact, what you believe they are theoretically. So shifting gears to our second consideration, the focal depth, it's, it's quite striking how much variability there is in skull thickness, depending on where you target. I'm going to find my laser pointer here. Hopefully everyone can see that little light. So uh, on your forehead here, th these are great heat maps from a recent paper of um, skull thickness and skull density ratio. So on the left, you see a heat map of the, of the entire skull uh, kind of splayed out. So your eyes will be just right here and right here, and this is your forehead. And on the back is your uh, your inion is back here. Sorry, back here is your inion. Coronal suture would be here. Temporal bone, temporal bone, uh, occipital, occipital, and parietal, parietal. Uh, so these are um, thicknesses between four and ten millimeters. And then on the right we see something called the SDR skull density ratio, which is the ratio of cortical to cancellous bone that we talked about earlier in the skull at various points. Um, so around the forehead area, the skull is as thick as 10 millimeters on average, which is a uh, you know, centimeter. And also we have these uh, frontal sinuses, which are filled with air, typically in this region. And air, again, is the enemy of ultrasound. So you probably don't want to be sonicating anywhere on the forehead if you want to uh, achieve some good uh, focal targets. And on the other hand, in the temporal, bones, we see these very skinny, very thin areas in blue, which are you know, four millimeters or so. And that's why this is called the temporal window for ultrasound. So it, a great spot to, to, to sonicate through, um, especially if your focus is in temporal lobe or mesial structures. And then you also see a, a big thick area here, midline uh, and uh, around the occipital bone. And, if you look at the skull density ratio, this is uh, this value here. It's known that it'll make the focus both shallower and broader than than what it is measured in degassed water. Typically, for fuss, uh, high intensity fuss, we want a skull density ratio of 0 0.4 or higher on average through the whole skull. Of course, there we have thousand transducers. Typically, in most neuromodulation experiments, you have one transducer. So this kind of map here. Uh, it is also somewhat useful to look at. And so more uh, beyond just skull thickness and density, though, one should also think about the cortical topography near your region of interest. So basically, what is your scalp to cortex distance? 
uh, where you want to sonicate. And these values will be, again, helpful in selecting a transducer with the appropriate vocal depths that you need. We can see that the sulci and gyri of the brain make these alternating canyons and peaks, with the average depth being somewhere around 20 millimeters or so, 20, 25 millimeters from the skin to the cortical region. But some areas, like the inferior frontal gyrus, and in your dominant hemisphere, this would be your, your Broca's area, they can be as deep as 40, 45 millimeters, which is, which is huge. And um, this has implications, again, on, on the, the type of transducer you select, or if it's a steerable transducer, then the depth you plug into your amplifier. And then let me turn off the laser. Or actually, I'll keep it on. So I'm going to talk about some of the devices out there. Um, First, I'll start off with the off-the-shelf, commercially available ultrasound transducers that are specifically designed for human neuromodulation, which didn't exist when I started uh, my PhD, but are just now appearing on the market. The commercial devices the, for human uh, TUS, uh, the obvious advantages is that it's you know, designed and purpose-built for transcranial penetration. Um, and so it's going to have the skull in mind when these devices were tested and designed. So you can be fairly certain that the power they have and the capabilities they have are sufficient to penetrate the skull adequately. Often though, they're plug and play. So they come with an amplifier, they come with a signal generator, but not always. And uh, the company often provides tech support. And so if there's any problems, you can call them up and discuss with someone on the team who will be uh, very aware of the biological uh, issues underlying these devices. Uh, or underlying the use of these devices, rather than just with a pure engineer, which which I think is an advantage here. Some disadvantages, uh, sometimes they will have proprietary software and a, and a proprietary interface, which means if you want to swap out an amplifier, it, it will be difficult. Uh, there, there is an upfront investment with uh, plug and play devices like this. Um, they uh, will be perhaps more costly than assembling everything yourself. But later on, that may pay out in terms of the time you've saved. So that's kind of a decision to make with, with your teams. Some of the devices out there, I think there's really only three. There might be more, so I apologize if I missed some. But the ones I'm aware of, one is the, uh, the BX Pulsar. This has been described in a few papers where the first in man sonication of the thalamus was accomplished, and more recently, altering pain thresholds. The references are there if you want to check them out. This transducer operates at a fundamental of 650, so a little bit higher up on the, um, on the, uh, on the scale that we saw earlier. It has been used to, uh, in MRI targeting, so it should be ferro non ferromagnetic, I apologize. And so it should be completely MRI safe and TMS safe as well. If you want to use a TMS coil nearby, that should not be a problem. Uh, it's been reported to achieve uh, between five to eight centimeter penetration depths in the papers. It is fairly large, so six to seven centimeters in diameter from what's been described in the literature. So, you know, perhaps not the best if you want to uh, do something like place EEG electrodes around there or put a TMS coil on top. Uh, there is a a bit of a humming reported in the literature as well. So when it's sonicating, it does appear to make a sound. Um, but that's the case with most transducers, I believe, uh, at least the ones I've worked with. Second of all, uh, the stores Neuroliths. So this is a um, pioneering device that was first to receive the European Union approval for treatment of neurological disorder in 2018 with a proof of concept study in Alzheimer's patients, which I've uh, cited down there. What's interesting about this device is the mode of operation is substantially different from most other transducers in that it delivers ultra short pulses or ultra short cycles, I should call them, of about three microseconds at about four hertz. Um, so it's not a full uh, burst like we're used to. It's, it's literally one cycle of three microseconds, which is tiny at a fairly high intensity. And this is repeated every 300 milliseconds or so. Presumably, the goal here is to disrupt plaque and uh, perhaps improve outcome. Um, but the device does appear to come bundled with a full suite of neuronavigation uh, software 
and uh, and targeting, which is which is a big advantage. So it looks like you can see in real time where you're sonicating, and you can kind of track the progress of, of, of the sonicated regions. From the photo on the website, it does look to be um, substantially bulky, at, at least in the uh, kind of superficial to deep dimension. And so it wouldn't be the ideal choice of transducer for, again, online TMS uh, or other devices nearby. Um, the third device is the BrainBox NeuroFuss. And we use the predecessor of this one in our lab for our most recent paper. Uh, this now has a, a large variety of fundamental frequencies available. And uh, most of them do have a steerable array, meaning you can, you're not limited to one particular depth. You can choose a depth on the uh, screen, on the amplifier, and uh, sonicate at various depths, which is, which is great if you want to target both cortex and white matter or a deeper um, nucleus within the brain. It does have MATLAB integration for uh, programmers. And uh, it, what's interesting about this is that it has a built-in coupling medium. So this, this yellow stuff is, a, is, a, is something you don't need to change every time you sonicate. You just need to clean it and apply a little bit of liquid gel. Um, but uh, that's also an advantage and it's fairly comfortable. There is, again, a slight buzzing with this device. And they can, they can be on the large side, depending on, on which form factor you choose. But again, that's something to consider, depending on your research question. Next, I'll talk about customizing a transducer. So this is certainly available, and this is what we did as well for one of our studies. And uh, there are many, many manufacturers out there. I've listed them above here that do customize transducers or that will sell you a transducer that is not originally designed to use on uh, on human subjects, perhaps a materials transducer or an industrial transducer. So advantages here, you can customize it. There are almost an unlimited amount of, of, of uh, designs you can request. Often they'll come with a standard DNC connection and um, you can uh, pick and choose your own amplifier, your own signal generator and uh, swap the transducers out. That's not a problem as long as you have the, uh, the ability or the willingness to pay for a, a impedance matching module, or you can make your own. The cost is can be an advantage. So as with most things, it's often cheaper to assemble things yourself, but then you have to deal with the problems yourself. <laughs> so the cons here, uh, I already mentioned some of them. It's not purpose built for transcranial transmission oftentimes. So you have to figure everything out. There probably will be tech support for things like transducer broke, it's not working. But if you're not, you know, getting a physiological outcome or your brain targeting's off, probably not as much. So some disadvantages there. I want to talk a little bit about coupling media and technique because uh, it's imperative, as we all know, to eliminate the air layer between the transducer and the subject's skin because air reflects almost all of the ultrasonic energy, almost 100%. And uh, for the ultrasonic beam to reach the brain effectively, you want a material between your transducer and the scalp that has a low absorption coefficient and that has an acoustic impedance similar to or higher than that of, of your treated tissues. So in this case, that's not the brain, it's the scalp because that's what's in direct contact um, or direct uh, interface with your transducer. Some other considerations, you want this to be fairly inexpensive either because you want to be switching out these gels or uh, media every uh, every subject. And this is particularly important now with COVID. You want to keep things sterile or as, at least as clean as possible. So what we use, and I'll talk about that, are uh, disposable gelatin patties. And uh, these are not that expensive. Or you want them to be durable and disinfectable. Uh, so something like that that yellow built-in transducer, sorry, built-in uh, coupling medium I mentioned earlier would be advantageous. And finally, you want this to be fairly inert in terms of biological um, reactivity, something that people won't be allergic to. This is our technique, and um, 
you can try this out in your lab, especially if you have a wet lab or some sort of uh, precise cutting instrument. We purchased these uh, Aqua, Aqua Flex gel pads, which are really massive, like they're several centimeters high and almost I think six or seven centimeters in diameter. So just using them as is is not ideal. So what we do is we uh, mount them in a, in a microtome, freeze the bottom so that it sticks, and then we use the blade to cut very, very thin sections of about one to two millimeters. And we cut a lot of them and we keep them in the fridge and use them as quickly as possible within a few days to prevent uh, air diffusion and prevent air bubbles. And that's worked for us quite well. Uh, more creative solutions that I've recently come across. This is a paper from 2017. Um, if your transducer or your target is uh, irregular for whatever reason, and uh, you want something that's a bit more resistant to, to shearing and distortion, our, our uh, gels that we cut, for example, if you move the transducer too much, they will fracture and break. Um, and so uh, with this kind of paradigm, what they've used is simple latex gloves. Uh, they've stretched the latex glove over a, a little ring, a 3D printed ring or a ring of plastic. And they filled it with uh, deionized degassed water. And based on the experiments here, they've shown that this is just as good as immersing your transducer in, in pure water uh, without any you know, physical coupling medium. Which is which is really good. So we haven't tried this, but it's something to to look into. As I said before, it's imperative to eliminate the air layer between the transducer and the subject's skin. But even after you do that with with some sort of gel or polymer, there's still the concern of trapping mainly air bubbles, but also debris, which can distort and scatter your nice theoretical focus that you want to accomplish on your simulation, and uh, in turn affect your results. Uh, the main interfaces to consider here are uh, threefold with a little bonus at the end. So you have your transducer at the top. You have your transducer coupling medium interface right here. And then you have within the media itself. So if you make your own coupling gel, for example, there is a chance that small air bubbles will be trapped inside and are very difficult to get rid of. And then also between your coupling medium and the scalp. In this case, it will be um, when you place the transducer on top of the subject. Finally, the bonus interface to worry about is the hair-hair interface. And uh, not all subjects will be bald. Um, so those that aren't, what we do in our lab is we take a, a brush and uh, we put some like regular ultrasound liquid gel and we brush the hair apart. That's really the best that we can do here. But inevitably, there will be bubbles in the hair-hair inter interface. Um, and so, you know, that's another uh, approach that you might have to discuss. Obviously, shaving the scalp is, is often a no-go. The ethics board will uh, immediately reject your application. I I'm joking, but I usually that's not something at least healthy subjects or even patients will prefer when volunteering for a study. Um, some of the validation experiments we did just to show that we have minimal bubbles in our coupling medium. And I apologize for the, the messy organization of these images. I tried to copy and paste them and that did not work. But uh, the, the, what this is trying to show is within panel A is we have one of those patties that we nicely cut and we place it on top of our transducer. And almost always there's going to be one or several air bubbles just from the, the layering of the, of the, of the uh, ultrasound gel. And when we take an imaging transducer and we place it on top of that uh, gel patty, we're able to see directly visualize the uh, coupling medium to transducer interface. And you see a, a large artifact from the bubble. And this is bad. So what we do is we manually extrude that bubble carefully. And panel B shows it removed, at least visibly. We redo the ultrasound imaging scan, see no artifact, a nice homogeneous medium there. And then in panel C, uh, we are looking then at the third interface, which is the uh, scalp to coupling medium interface. And in this case, it was placed on the forehead with no hair. And so you can see some of the, um, the, the uh, impedance mismatch of the skull, but no bubbles again. So uh, the reason to put up this slide is 
uh, when you're designing your experiment, one way to check to see if your coupling medium is adequate is to either use an imaging transducer like we did, um, or if your transducer is able to go into imaging mode, you can actually both check your bubbles and sonicate at virtually the same time or very close temporarily speaking. Ours does not have that feature, so we couldn't do that, but if yours does, then this is perfect. I'd like to talk about confounders because these are important in, in all research, but particularly TUS. Uh, two categories of confounders that, that we've come across. One is device and technique related. So things like magnetic interaction, if you're dealing with TMS bus close proximity, sonication artifact, if you're dealing with EEG uh, captures from the transducer vibrating. Uh, targeting inaccuracy related to your targeting technique, so either fMRI, sorry, MRI guided or uh, neuro navigation guided or uh, skin landmark guide, and then the second broad category is subject related, so related to the physiology of the human uh, peripheral central nervous system and their interaction. Um, first category is peripheral stimulation, so it's almost inevitable that, with at least with many transducer you're going to have some sort of sound being made, sound being generated when the transducer is powered on. And this sound can sometimes be heard externally. So the sound can be heard from the experimenter and the subject, of course. And this is through the air, just normal sound transmission. But also you have an element of bone conduction. So the, uh, the acoustic waves and some of their harmonics, the dirtier frequencies, so to speak, can travel longitudinally across the skull and uh, uh, enter your cochlea and cause bony conduction, which is something that's hard to control for. Somatosensory vibration, some transducers have been reported to create a buzzing sound or a tingling sensation. And heating, sometimes if you're prolonging your sonication or sonicating at a very high intensity, um, the brain will be safe, but the, uh, the skin can get heated up inevitably. Psychological subject-related compounds are things like anticipatory, unblinding, and uh, placebo effect. So related to the peripheral stimulation, if the subject hears a sound, they might anticipate the next sound coming up. If your ISI is regular, let's say you're delivering pulses every six seconds or 10 seconds, the subject's going to anticipate the next pulse. Similar to TMS, there are ways to, to control for that. Um, unblinding both subject and experimenter. And placebo effect for some of the preliminary clinical trials coming out. It's hard to um, blind that you have a transducer on your head and that it's working, but I'm sure something will uh, be developed like a sham transducer. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about the sonication artifact that we're seeing from EEG experience, experiments, and this is related to that device-related category. So at the bottom there, you see the raw EEG trace from uh, an electrode that's about a centimeter away from the transducer, and the start of the sonication is indicated by this, this vertical red, sorry, vertical gray line, and there's a very clear artifact here. Immediately, a sonication starts and continues throughout the time period of the sonication. So we found an easy way to get rid of that is to filter the signal. And it turns out that the artifact is mainly uh, related to the pulse repetition frequency. In this case, it's set to 1,000 uh, 1, hertz. And so with a low-pass filter, you can pretty much remove this artifact fairly easily, which is good. Another confounder that's interesting to think about is, is magnetism. So in our case, we found an effect of motor evoked potential suppression with a focused ultrasound applied at the same time as TMS. So in other words, our TMS-induced motor evoked potentials were lower in amplitude when bus was delivered both before and during the, uh, the TMS pulses compared to if TMS is administered alone. And one of the immediate questions that one might have when looking at this sort of data and results is, well, if your transducer all somehow altered the magnetic electromagnetic field induced by the TMS coil, specifically if the transducer made the, uh, the field either 
lower or distorted, then that can easily explain the results. And so these kind of, of control experiments are important to do um, because as uh, since we're not the ones designing the transducers in many cases, it's difficult to know exactly what's in them. And uh, they are powered by an amplifier, they have electronic components. So it's not unreasonable to think that something in there might be ferromagnetic or uh, altering the magnetic field. So what we did here in this experiment is uh, we put a Hall effect sensor about uh, 18 to 20 millimeters above the focused ultrasound transducer TMS stimulator. And uh, what the Hall effect sensor does is it translates a magnetic field uh, intensity and polarity into a voltage output. And so when there's no magnet near the sensor, it outputs 2.5 volts all the time. When there's a, a north magnetic uh, pole approaching the sensor or even statically near the sensor and not moving, the voltage drops to zero and uh, it's linearly proportional to the magnetic field. So you can have intermediate values too. And conversely, if you flip the magnet and you put a, a south pole near the detector, the voltage goes out and plateaus at around five volts. And so with the experiments down here, we turned the TMS off completely. Uh, we took the transducer out of its holder and measured kind of the baseline voltage, 2.5 volts as expected. Then we placed the transducer in its holder and we sonicated with a transducer just into the air. Still 2.5 volts. And then we turned the transducer off, still 2.5 volts. So everything seems to be um, quite reasonable for baseline. What's more interesting is what happens when you place objects, known ferromagnetic objects, into that holder instead of the transducer. So here, again, we remove the transducer, but this time we fire the TMS coil at a very low intensity, so 6%. And what we find is this uh, voltage drop that's extremely uh, reproducible. So this is an average of about 10 frames. And the error bars are there, but you'd have to zoom in to see them. And uh, what we see is a, a fairly predictable voltage drop here. If we place an electrode in there, the voltage drop is a marginally smaller, but basically the same. A BNC connector is, is more substantial and so that causes the voltage to go down uh, and, and, and reduce in peak to peak whereas if I put some bike chain in there the voltage drop is, is even further reduced and statistically this can be seen here so the electrode almost no difference BNC holder significant and chain very significant so now for the real experiment what we want to know is with a TMS on does the detected field on the other side of the transducer, is that altered with the transducer there and sonicated? So uh, in the top here, we have the vertical sensor mounting. So this is detecting the, the magnetic field perpendicular um, with zero watts or the transducer completely off. We see that same drop that we saw before with a transducer sonicating active at its maximum intensity that we used for the human experiments there's no statistical difference. When we remove the transducer entirely, again, no difference. So then we ask the question, well, what if we flip the horizontal sensor um, into this orientation? Then we're detecting the magnetic field vector perpendicular to the one above. We have a different pattern of magnetic uh, flux, but again, no difference in all three conditions, which is good. So uh, this transducer is also very likely MRI safe for that reason. So I encourage everyone to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple experiment and kind of gives you that assurance that you're not dealing with a mechanical um, device related compound. Some safety considerations. Uh, TUS for neuromodulation so far has a good track record. It's very safe. There's some excellent human studies out released uh, this year and last year by a few groups reviewing the safety guidelines and uh, reviewing some of the mild side effects and uh, that subjects have experienced. But something that's important for, for a lab is to have a clear detailed operating protocol for your transducer and for your amplifier. Yeah, these are, are fairly technical devices and uh, you know sometimes there's no safeguards. And so, especially with custom transducers, custom amplifiers, and because the field is fairly new, 
there is no established or universally recognized guidelines for safe application of, of tests. Uh, but there are guidelines for diagnostic ultrasound that you see on the right here by the FDA. And these are fairly technical uh, intensity values that we can talk about in the question period, but they do exist. And so what I think is important is when having a lab is to, is, you know, set some clear guidelines of what happens if either the subject expresses concern and says, you know, ouch, this is hurting, or the experimenter expresses concern and sees the transducer, you know, um, change position. Um, for example, a lot of the transducers described in the experiments are strapped to the head. And so you might be thinking that if there's a concern, you might go and try to stop your script or unplug the transducer. But really, uh, the first thing to do is to make sure that your strap is easily unbuckled and, and unbuckle the strap and remove the transducer. Um, you can deal with the script later. Of course, quantify your transducers and check your electrical certification. Um, some universities will have a requirement that your transducer and anything that's plugged into the wall, essentially, your amplifier mostly, has the relevant electrical certification so that the insulation doesn't melt or you don't start a fire. Fairly basic things. And uh, quantification of your transducers in free water in a hydrophone setup is, is extremely important. Um, to establish some baseline readings of what sort of intensities you're expecting at various foci and various um, uh, axial distances. Something that we do in the Professor Chen and Professor Lozano's labs is we test the transducer on our forearms. That's a good way to gauge uh, whether your coupling is adequate and whether your intensities are going to be too high uh, for uh, a subject to tolerate, especially if it's a new paradigm you know, minutes of sonication or something along those lines. Um, if your forearm feels hot or warm, probably the subject will feel hot or warm on their scalp. So something needs to change. Uh, for that reason, we refrigerate our, our uh, coupling media as well. And something I think the most important thing is, or one of the most important things is to do a brief neurological examination before, at least before your experiment, so that you have some sort of baseline. Um, and preferably after if you're dealing with a novel sonication paradigm. Um, going back to the guidelines for safe application of, of transcranial ultrasound, even though there's no white paper quite yet, uh, that's something that's being worked on. So stay tuned. Thought I should mention that. Um, Okay, so transducer holders, I won't spend too much time on this because this is just our experience and you're going to probably have something completely unique to your own research question. But what we did is um, we wanted to couple the, uh, the, the, the ultrasound transducer to the TMS coil and following the footsteps of Lagon's paper, uh, we designed a similar uh, custom holder that was 3D printed, which worked quite well. And uh, the way we do it is using a software called Fusion 360, which is fantastic. I love it. It's, uh, it's free for an educational license. So if you're a university or a PhD student or a master's student, you can get the software for free. Um, and uh, you can design anything you want and then either print it through your university department if, if you have a printing facility or if someone in your lab happens to have a 3D printer, you can, you can print it out. And this sort of folder takes about an hour to print, so it's, it's not that um, it's not that long. And if you need to make modifications, you can just print another one. Um, some other interesting applications of these holders. So uh, we designed a holder for our transducer, which has a built-in uh, offset here for the coupling media. In our case, it's the the thin gelatin patties that we put on, and also has a built-in strap uh, strap slit to be able to uh, put a head strap in. And then this, of course, is for the uh, BNC cables to come out. And then at the bottom, we have a variation of this. We have uh, uh, an adapter here for the neuro navigation stylus. So if you want to do a post hoc um, confirmation of where you were sonicating, you can put your neuro navigation stylus in there for brain sight, for example, and, and capture the position of your transducer and compensate afterwards for the offset of the thickness of the device. You can also do, instead of doing post hoc, even better would be to do pre hoc or 
before the experiment, you can validate where you're going to be about to sonicate and uh, do the same thing and then do your experiment. This, uh, a few slides here just to, to end off. Um, this was created by my uh, co-author on the eLife paper, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, Stanley Chen, who's now a director of movement disorders in uh, the National Taiwan University. And so a few tips from him on how to conduct bus if you choose to go um, the online TMS route. So, of course, you want to keep your, your coil, your TMS coil, as close as possible to the scalp. Now, you are limited by your ultrasound transducer in this case if your TMS target and your ultrasound target are the same. So getting as slim transducer as possible is important. A lot of the uh, TMS stimulators are able to compensate for up to two centimeters of offset, but that just means you have to dial up your maximal uh, stimulator output percentage on your TMS amplifier to somewhere you know close to 90% for that. For our experiment, our usual intensities were from, say, like from 65 to sometimes close to 90 for this kind of offset here. When you're stimulating with just a transducer, it's easy enough to leave it and then it likely won't shift. But if you have a TMS coil in there that's manually held, um, just be aware that your position might be uh, altered by a slight change in your, in your in your rotation of your stimulator. And that's the case for TMS alone as well, but with the transducer, it's, it's quite a bit more sensitive to your target, of course, because your beam is usually um, on the order of millimeters in, in axial width, whereas your TMS field is much, much broader. Um, so a few more points here. Uh, of course, using non-ferromagnetic devices is very important, uh, not only to reduce distortion reduction of the magnetic field, but also to prevent damage to your transducer. Um, make sure you don't have any bubbles in your coupling media or in any of the relevant uh, interfaces we talked about earlier. And uh, confirm that your coil and, and ultrasound are in the right location to hit the hotspot consistently. And uh, Again, be aware that the gel or the coupling media you use may deviate slightly, either shift if it's a solid uh, component, or if you're using liquid gel, it might start to smear around it. So uh, something to think about. That'll affect certainly your focality of your class, of your test. Uh, there are a few more advanced techniques when you're assessing intracortical circuit function, paired pulse, and so on. Um, just ensure that you're bus on status control because our experiments as well as previous experiments in the Legon group have found that uh, ultrasound does tend to reduce your TMS elicited motor vote potential. So it's important to control for that in your uh, paired pulse paradigms. So that's it for me. I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, my mentors, Professor Andres Lozano and Professor Dr. Uh, Robert Chen as well as our co-investigators and collaborators for ongoing guidance and support. Finally, my home program from the University of Manitoba, Clinician Investigator Program for their support. And uh, uh, I'm happy to take any questions now and we can chat. Thanks, Anton. That was fantastic. Loads of really good practical insights there that I don't think anyone would get without actually figuring out how to do it themselves, which is precisely what these webinars are all about. Uh, so yeah, we have got time for questions. So if you do want to pop some more in, we can get them answered now. We did get some during the webinar itself. Um, so this one relates to the slide you had towards the beginning showing um, the number of publications uh, at each acoustic fundamental frequency. Yes, I'll uh, go to that slide right now. Yep. There you go. So, uh, did you look at previous years? Is it or is it just for 2021? That's no. Right. So this is uh, my attempt at, at you know collecting as many as I could from all time. Uh, what's not included in here is, is animal studies. This is just human studies, and uh, I did not include a blood-brain barrier disruption, and I did not include high-intensity focused ultrasound for lesion. So this is strictly neuromodulation without micro bubble administration without blood brain barrier disruption and without lesioning of brain tissue. Got you. 
And I think you did, on the next question, you did touch upon this, uh, uh, but I think just good to recap. Uh, what was the name of the software for the 3D printing again? And oh, yes. The, and the files available somewhere for the ultrasound community to use? Absolutely. So it's, um, it's called Fusion 360, F-U-S, ironically starts with F-U-S, I-O-N 360. So if you yeah. type that in to Google and then you type in... Um, educational license or something like that, it'll give you the link immediately, but I'm happy to share that with anyone who emails me or, you know, who emails uh, you. If I can provide you the link and you can post it somewhere. But yeah, great software. It it's a little bit of a learning curve like with anything, but um, essentially what, what the basics of it is, is you measure your transducer or whatever device you want to print around uh, with a caliper or ruler, uh, depending on how precise you need to be. And then you, you draw a three-dimensional sketch exactly like in paint of uh, one of the dimensions. So either you know, face on, top down, or from the side. Yeah. And then you simply extrude that sketch. So if you want to do a, a cylinder, for example, you draw a circle just like in paint. And then with one click, it extrudes into a cylinder. And that's essentially a holder. Uh, of course, you need to have a, a divot in there for your transducer. So you draw another smaller circle. And then you extrude it inwards to delete that, that section. And that's your holder right there. And then you can add whatever you want to it, like the adapters or, or whatnot. It takes five minutes. Uh, the 3D printing is, is obviously a lot more um, resource intensive. But as far as I'm aware, most universities now have a, a, a department that will do that for you. So it sounds, sounds pretty, pretty cool. So the next one question, I know you've quite had some experience with this directly as well from your recent publication in eLife. Do you have any suggestions for neuromodulation protocols? Yes, yeah, so I think that there are a lot of them out there, which is fantastic. Um, and the answer will depend entirely on what you're trying to do. Yeah. So the, 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 uh, the individual asking that question have a um, clarification of what, what they want to do. Do they want to suppress something? Do they want to excite something? Do they want to see plasticity? Do they want to... So I, I think the answer is yes, I do. But uh, for our purposes, we use the, a sonication duration of about half a second and um, pulse repetition frequency of about 1,000 hertz. And our fundamental was 500 kilohertz, mm -hmm. right where the most popular peak is there on the slide. And these were parameters that were initially discovered by uh, Lagon in 2018, I believe, with this paper. And we iterated on that um, discovery and, and tried uh, a wide range of parameters, essentially, and tried to find some sort of dose response curve for uh, specifically um, affecting cortical excitability. But there are many other papers out there and a lot of animal literature uh, for excitatory protocols as well. And for you know, that have shown it's uh, fMRI bold signal changes, some out of sensory evoke potential changes. There's a, a wealth of them out there. Uh, so the, the person who asked the question, uh, they did clarify a bit in the questions when you started to answer. I think so they're looking for more longer longer term effects uh, for like yeah. use the treatment. So I'm assuming this means plasticity like protocols. Do you have any suggestions for things like that? Yeah, so I, I mean, there's certainly papers out there already that describe this. Uh, one of the papers I'm aware of is, is by Gibson. We used a, a diagnostic ultrasound transducer and showed a excitatory effect on motor evoked potentials. Uh, and so his protocol, I believe, consisted of an offline sonication regime where you have a baseline TMS MEP capture then you sonicate for a number of minutes. Then you do TMS again and see how that changes. And so that's one of the excitatory paradigms out there. Um, uh, as well, one fairly consistent topic that comes out in the literature every, every couple of years is the elicitation of, of phosphines. So basically sonication of, of your visual region, your yeah. occipital cortex, and having the subjects um, report that they see flashes of light with their eyes closed. So that can be interpreted as excitatory, but there are a number of, of potential 
other mechanisms at play here and potentially some confounders as well. Uh, I, I don't know much about those regimes, but those are something to look at if you're interested about um, in uh, excitatory paradigms. Thanks for that. So the next question is, thank you for the talk. Uh, could you please elaborate on reasons to apply ultrasound coming back to the language barrier of neurons and what the underlying mechanisms of the effects might be? Yes, absolutely. Um, this So mechanisms of focused ultrasound are under investigation, uh, but it should be noted that DBS, deep brain stimulation with an electrode, which is almost 100 years old now, those mechanisms are also under investigation. So um, there's a lot to be discovered about the brain, but we do know some things. Um, a lot of the mechanistic underpinnings are starting to come out in the in vitro literature. Um, and so there's a number of papers that are extremely well designed that look at things like ion channel flux with the application of ultrasound, specifically ion channels found in neurons. And uh, some of the theories around that are that the, uh, the mechanical waves of, of the ultrasound deform the bilayer membrane of the neuron and in turn either cause microcavitation between the within the membrane or like actually deform the the protein structure of the ion channels which leads to an altered level of permeability of the ions which in turn alters your uh, depolarization likelihood yeah. etc so that's one of the uh, what's, that's one of the hypotheses how exactly that happens is uh, at the moment still unknown um, there's also some evidence in the animal literature that some of the changes that were thought to be due to direct stimulation of, of neurons might be due to actually a, a peripheral confound or a peripheral effect. So they're real effects, certainly, but they might be caused because of the animal uh, animal's auditory region being activated, yeah. which in turn excites the motor cortex, which in turn changes the 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 observed effects uh or maybe a startle response uh, yeah. if the animal is slightly anesthetized so there's a lot out there in humans i should mention back to the question about the excitatory paradigm in humans what i'm really excited to, to see come out is for someone to discover a, a set of parameters that can excite the, the motor cortex to such a degree that you get a, a frank mep or motor evoked potential with ultrasound alone that would be really interesting. Uh, so far, that hasn't been shown, and many studies have attempted this, including us, and we haven't been successful. But the animal literature seems to suggest that this is entirely possible. So the the, the, the rats and the rodents that were investigated actually have not only motor evoked potentials, but have frank contractions of their forelimbs and tail. So, you know, something definitely to explore, and the parameter uh, the parameter domain is so broad that there's going to be a lot of, of room for investigation, I think. Thanks for that. So we've got quite a few coming questions in now. We've got like a good like eight. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this one is a good practical question. How necessary do you think MR-based neural navigation for TUS will be in the future? And are mm. there any brain areas or types of studies which will rely on this? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that we've definitely discussed in, in our lab many times. So I think it depends on your region of interest. So for cortical regions, what we've used is, uh, well, in our study, we used post hoc confirmation using uh, individualized MRIs. Um, but really what's used uh, in the TMS literature quite often is uh, both hot spotting, but also um, doing a pre-experiment MRI and then using MRI neuro navigation to find your cortical target and, and, and TMS, uh, that particular target. Now in FUS, I think um, offline, so to speak, MRI neuro navigation before the experiment is probably enough for cortical targets. For deeper targets, I think MRI targeting would be fantastic if done correctly. So I really think it depends on the brain region and how specific you really want to get with your target. Do you want to target a, you know, a subnucleus of some structure? Do you want to target the entire 
um, corpus callosum or you know thalamus or, or something like that. Perhaps if you want to target an entire structure, deep structure, or a network, perhaps you don't need to be uh, as accurate as MRI guidance gives you. But it's definitely an asset to have, and some of the challenges around that are having a transducer and equipment that are compatible with the MRI bore. But above and beyond that, it's actually convincing your technicians in the hospital or in the research facility that it's, it's safe to bring these things in. So I haven't seen too many of these, but I think uh, phantom studies are going to be the next way to go. Uh, just like in DBS literature, we show that a certain DBS device is safe to use in the MRI bore by doing a, a brain phantom and showing that there's negligible temperature change. I think something like that would be very valuable to do in ultrasound transducers. Fantastic. Thank you, Anton. Uh, are you still happy to accept a few more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So thanks for the fantastic presentation, Anton. Could you perhaps elaborate a bit more on how researchers control for confounds arising from peripheral input, so somatosensory or auditory inputs, and whether sure. I think we can follow up with participants to see if the blinding procedure works? Yes, great question. Um, yes, so for us, the auditory confound was probably the most significant, and um, in the sense that at least for the experimenters, it was fairly clear when sonication was happening and when it was not. Uh, for participants, strikingly, when we asked them casually, you know, could you detect the difference? Most of them said no. And in part, I think the reason is uh, most of our experiments were using the, the transducer in combination with the TMS. And as, uh, as is quite clear, the TMS makes a very loud uh, clicking sound, which effectively masks the ultrasound underneath. But because we were sonicating just before the TMS as well, we tried to mask that with a speaker placed near the, the, the participant, and that created a high-pitched noise that subjectively, to most people that we asked, and to ourselves, sounded very much like the transducer. Um, but of course, the problem now becomes bone transmission. And so if anyone's ever used those um, bone conduction headphones that allow you to hear the traffic around you and avoid some cars on your bike while listening to music, um, those things are, are, they feel deep, you know, they feel like they're coming from your head. And a, a speaker mounted beside you will feel substantially different, even if the frequency is exactly the same or the song is the same. Um, so uh, there, there could be strategies involving something like that as a, as a mask. Um, the other great paper that came out recently, um, apologize, I forget the name of the first author. Oh, I believe it's Brown, B-R-A-U-N, um, showed that using a pair of headphones and masking the focused ultrasound sham condition from the real sonication effectively uh, produced two things. One is, is a very similar somatosensory evoked potential, from what I recall. And uh, two is, I think they did a psychophysics task and um, experiment rather, and the subjects couldn't perceive the difference between the two with the kind of setup they had with the headphones. So I think headphones are, are great based on that study. Um, and if, if that experimenter is in the audience, I apologize if I didn't get some of those details right, but it's a great paper. So, um, and in terms of somatosensory confounds, that one, uh, the tingling and the, the sensation on the skin, that one, we, we don't really know how to uh, control for that. Maybe like a peripheral electrical stimulator, like a TENS unit might be one way, but I imagine that Electrical stimulation of your scalp will feel quite different from uh, from uh, acoustic sonication, but we we haven't tried that yet. So something to look into for sure. Fantastic, thanks for that again, Anton. Um, do you know of any studies that have combined uh, MR, TFAS, and TMS so far? Lots that have combined fMRI and focused ultrasound. Um, Quite, uh, and now increasingly the number that have combined TMS with, uh, with ultrasound. All three? I don't know. I, I can't recall a study. There might be one, but I, I can't recall I one off the top of my head. On the top Do you know, Rory? Maybe you know. No, no, I was about to say, I checked 
almost daily now, and I've not seen any on TAS, TMS, and FMRI at the same time. But yeah. if, if it's possible, someone will almost certainly do it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, it, it, again, I think the big barrier here will be your, your technicians, for a good reason. Your yeah. The MRI technicians will, will say, oh, so you want to bring a TMS coil? You want to bring a, a focused ultrasound transducer into the bore? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think uh, I think a lot of uh, phantom experiments will be needed for something like that. But uh, I think the findings would be quite valuable for that experiments to uh, take place. And perhaps a more uh, measured approach would be to do offline effects. So if you did yeah. TMS, uh, put the subject in the in the MRI scanner, did some more TMS, yeah, back and forth, uh, yeah. So we've we got four more questions now, and after that, I'll. I'll cut it just because we've been having the questions for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, uh, hang on, let's make sure I've not missed any. Uh, uh, did I understand correctly that you plan to take CTs, not just MRIs for your healthy participants to estimate skull composition for modeling? Yeah, so in, in our department for neurosurgery, we, um, we have a high intensity focused ultrasound unit, uh, the Exablate. And everyone gets CTs for that because uh, they're, the, the phase corrections that need to take place for focused ablation require CT metrics, like skull density ratio and uh, the topology of the skull. But with focused neuromodulation, sorry, focused ultrasound neuromodulation experiments, usually we use one transducer. And we, in our paper, we used MRI to estimate skull thickness, but that is, uh, that is an imperfect estimate. Uh, because we treat the skull as a homogeneous medium, which it's not, as you can see in the slide there. So CT would be really the way to go and in combination with um, a sophisticated delivery uh, program and modeling with K-Wave or with another physics uh, simulator, you might be able to get an even more precise targeting and more effective and more clear results than just using neuronavigation or just using MRI. Yeah, fantastic. So this question's a, a bit of a broader one. Uh, thanks for the talk, Dr. Flamenco. How do you see the future of TUS? Do you think there will be a replacement for more permanent mod neuromodulation strategies, such as bus or deep brain stimulation leads, where patients don't need to return to the clinic for treatments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So as I mentioned, the high-intensity ultrasound is already taking over some of that niche with the lesioning of, uh, of uh, thalamotomies, for example, for movement disorders. But uh, low intensity focused ultrasound at the moment, I don't think it's, it's close to replacing anything that's available clinically. In the future, um, perhaps it'll fill a, a niche similar to TMS in that uh, it'll be used to either interrogate brain activity or used as a more longer term treatment to maybe affect plasticity and affect um, brain circuitry. Um, there are some studies in, quite a few studies in rodent literature that show that certain parameters of TUS can inhibit or prevent seizure generation. Uh, I know there's a clinical trial of the same in humans currently, so if that pans out, then that would be fantastic. One can you know, conceive of a wearable unit mm -hmm. that sonicates your mesial structures, your temporal lobe, if that's where your epileptic focus is, and either you know, reduces your seizure threshold or terminates a, sheet, a seizure, that would be fantastic. Yeah, it would be. Uh, so you're getting towards the end now. Uh, do you have any experience with stimulating different brain areas by changing changing the location of the transducer on the scalp during a single experimental session? Would you mm -hmm. have to keep good coupling even when moving the location of the transducer back and forth between two locations? Yeah, so we haven't done that, and uh, I think well, actually, we we have just observed that kind of. Um, uh, the change in the coupling medium. And I think with the patties we use, the hydrogel patties we use, that becomes almost impossible to just slide it over because the patties just get destroyed. Uh, they fall apart. Uh, if you use a liquid medium, like ultrasound gel, one can imagine reapplying gel as you move it over. 
Um, and uh, I think moving the transducer to, to a, another nearby brain region is important because it could be a, a nice spatial control to ensure that the results that you're seeing are not just simply due to, um, well, not simply, but are due to uh, network activation, for example. Um, so, yeah, so, so the answer is, I think, before moving into a different target, definitely somehow validate that your coupling medium is still intact. Um, having imaging capability of your transducer uh, would be fantastic. We don't have that, but if you did have that, you could you could switch to imaging mode, look at your screen, and say, "Oh, there's a bunch of bubbles. We should probably reapply." So, so the last couple of questions now. Uh, what are the advantages com of combining TMS with TUS? Uh, if we and if we would like to move the first targeted spot, how far can you move the focus without mm -hmm. rearranging the setup? Yeah, yeah. So for us, we chose the central position for our transducer within the two coil windings of the TMS because, uh, in general, and not always the case, but the the M1 primary motor cortex region of interest is located roughly at the epicenter of the magnetic field, and so we placed the tests over there so that we could potentially alter the excitability of that same region. And the advantage there is that TMS is a reliable probe of particle excitability. You can generate some objective motor evoke potential uh, readings, which can then be analyzed. Um, if you want to move the transducer over a little bit, yeah, um, I could imagine some sort of more sophisticated 3D printed setup with little uh, gears and, and rails that you could simply slide it back and forth. Mm -hmm. That's one option. Another option is to have multiple holders. Um, yet enough, another option is to decouple the two completely and just have them uh, uh, kind of uh, as separate units, essentially, with a, with a way to fix each one individually on the head, uh, with the TMS being held in the hand. Brilliant. Thank you. And last one now. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer all of these, by the way. Uh, is there any experimental evidence of microcavitation, or is it mainly theoretical at this point? Sure. Um, microcavitation. So I think cavitation is, from what I know at least, um, it, cavitation occurs with very high intensities typically. Yeah. Um, and uh, in animal studies, there there were a few reports that have shown histologically that there was some damage to the brain region in the sense that there was a little bit of extravasation, a little bit of a spot of hemorrhage. But it's it's unclear whether that was from the sonication itself or whether it was from the processing of the brain afterwards, post-mortem brain extraction and, and processing. Um, and also, I think the paradigm used in that experiment in large animal involved many, 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 many sonications over huge period of time. But apart from that, in terms of cavitation that manifests as a lesion or as a, uh, a spot on, the, on MRI after the experiment, I, I don't know of any in humans at least, uh, but certainly something to think about because, um, yeah, so because it's, it's with enough intensity, you, you can cause heating and undesirable heating is bad. Uh, you, you want your effects to be reversible for this kind of experiments, at least. Brilliant. Well, that's it for the questions, Anton. I'd just like to thank you again for giving such a good talk, giving us all the insights you've gained from doing this practically over an incredibly long time. We really appreciate it, and I'm sure the attendees as well. So thank you so much.